Hello, my zebras and spoonies. Thanks for coming and hanging out with me today. I am glad that you are here. Today, I'm going to be talking about the complexity of systemic problems. Uh, for those that don't know, I worked several years as a nurse manager. I hated it. But there is one thing that I learned while working in that capacity. Systemic problems need systemic solutions. And this means that you will never solve problems within a system by addressing individuals. It just doesn't work. So let's break it down and then discuss some of the implications of the concept. Um, so systemic problems are flaws or imperfections or issues that are ingrained or essential characteristics of an overall system. In other words, such problems are not due to specific individual or isolated cases. Rather, they're the result of the general background conditions of the system itself. They're a feature, not a bug. Systemic problems require changes to the structure, organization, or policies that govern that whole system. It's no use trying to reduce user error when the software has been coded in such a way to crash under routine operating conditions. In the quality improvement world, we call such conditions common causes. There are many things going on in our world today that are examples of systemic problems. Police violence is a systemic problem. Medication errors are a systemic problem. Students being bullied in public schools is a systemic problem. There is no way to fix these large complex problems by focusing on a single person or a single incident within the system. That being said, that doesn't mean that I don't think that we should be that we shouldn't be looking at individual cases um, of police violence and holding violent police accountable. I also believe that every medication error needs to be reviewed and assessed regardless of whether or not it causes harm. And yeah, we absolutely need to do our best to help out the student that is being bullied. But we cannot fall into the trap of believing that addressing these individual cases is going to solve the larger systemic problem that is leading to these cases happening. Instead, we need to be looking at the root causes. What is going on in these systems that is leading to the negative and unwanted outcomes that we're seeing? Once we find the causes within the system, we need to work to change the system to address these causes. Systemic problems persist not due to a lack of effort or concern, but often due to misdirected efforts. Actions such as more training, additional oversight, or reallocation of funds to and from programs are rarely enough to address systemic problems. We need this, we've seen this over and over again, especially in the medical field. Uh, where they will add in another in-service is the answer. But the increased educational offerings hasn't helped. Adding more regulations hasn't helped. Shuffling the funding around hasn't helped. So how do we address this bigger systemic problem that are ongoing and plaguing our society? Even when we recognize a problem as systematic, uh, it's easy to fall into the trap of dressing only its superficial aspects. We may add technology safeguards, punish the bad apples, update policy or associated penalties, or audit adherence to the rules more carefully for a time. We want to find the bug in the system and then just fix it. This works up to a point. And sometimes, but sometimes, we really need to upgrade the whole system to really truly address system problems. When problem solving, we tend to use a fishbone diagram to identify the man, machine, material, method, and measurement factors that are causing problems. These are what are known as special causes. They are inputs to the process that fail unpredictably and intermittently. While they shouldn't be ignored, when we focus on problem solving efforts on special causes, we leave common cause unexamined and the systematic roots unaddressed. So what is a fishbone diagram and why am I bringing it up? Well, I'm bringing it up because it is one of the seven most commonly used tools for quality control. It is considered a basic tool for quality assessment. You look at the problem and you put that on a line. And then you look at people, equipment, process, materials, environment, management. And each of this gets its own line that is attached to the problem line. And within each of those categories, like people, you look at how 
the people and the staffing and the use of people and their flow of work, et cetera, might contribute to the problem that you're having. And you go through this for the equipment, process, materials, environment, and the management of the problems. This style of analysis, by default, puts the focus onto the special causes, and thus we end up putting our efforts into the things that are the most unpredictable and most difficult to control. This is the standard way for problem solving when we're looking at systemic problems. And this is why we often, as a society, struggle to really address these bigger issues. Common cause factors lead to failures even when the inputs of people, equipment, and methods are perfectly adequate. Thus, it is important that we are addressing common cause rather than special cause factors. Common cause is talking about this random variation inherent in the performance of any system due to common cause factors. Common causes are those factors that result from policy, norms, culture, the broader environment, change that requires action on the leadership level. And this means that system needs to be changed rather than an individual within that system. How much of the problem with a systemic issue is due to common cause variation and how much is due to special cause variation? The rule of thumb is the 80-20 principle. In other words, for one special cause failure, there are four common cause failures. So as an example, for every police officer who commits a malicious act of violence against a civilian, there are likely four who hold no hate in their hearts but who stand by and allow it, simply going along with the norms of their system. And until the norms within that system are addressed, these four police officers are likely to continue to contribute to the problem through inaction. Common cause variation is a measure of a process's potential to perform properly when special cause variation is removed. In other words, even if every violent racist was removed from the force, it's not enough. The common cause co uh, conditions that generate these behaviors and otherwise well-intentioned people must also be removed. If the culture that violence is accepted remains in place, then people will continue to choose that option even when they normally wouldn't. And this is because in other situations, they don't feel that violence is an option allowed to them. When they can make a different choice, a small portion of them will make a different choice. And that is the nature of systems issues. So we need to eliminate the choices that we don't want people to make. Any type of problem solving is tempting to zero in on solutions and get to work right away. When facing systemic problems, it's more important than ever to grasp the overall scope. And this is hard because it requires looking at the big picture, the detailed parts, and also their interactions with each other. And it can also require broadening our examination to include interactions with adjacent systems. When grappling with this level of complexity, we need to resist our urge to settle on simple answers. The simplest solutions often fail to address an issue's glaring complexity. Consider charging nurses criminally for making medication errors. This is a recent trend that has arisen out of the idea of holding individuals accountable for the medication errors that they make. However, this is a simple solution to a very complex problem and fails to address the complexity of the issue. The first problem with this solution is the very real fact that it is only a matter of time before a nurse makes a medication error. Every nurse does their best to be accurate and correct with their medication passes. But the reality is that all of us make mistakes. This means that following through with holding us accountable for our errors would result in every nurse facing criminal charges and going to jail. This country would be left with no one to work. This simple solution does nothing to actually reduce the number of medication errors because nurses are already doing everything that we can to be accurate. So there is also no value in punishing a handful of nurses to serve as an example to get the rest of us to perform better. Superficial and simple solutions will never fully address the greater complexity 
of a systemic problem. When creating a map to visualize the system, it's useful to physically walk through the process that's in question. For a healthcare problem, walk through it as if you were the patient. For delivery of goods, walk as if you're the product. If uh, it's a justice process, you may need to do it not only from the viewpoint of the police officer and the uh, civilian, but also the victim. Walking the process in these shoes helps us develop empathy for each person who experiences the process. This helps us to see the system as it is rather than as we believe it to be. It helps us see where the system is failing to properly support the various people within the system rather than looking at how those people are failing the system. A good rule of thumb for managing a business is that ideal processes deliver what the consumer wants, when they want it, at one time, at a low cost, right the first time, safely, and so forth. These things are hard to argue with. They are not immediately achievable, but they provide a sort of true north reference point on your journey through your business. This is nearly impossible to do if we're addressing it at the detailed level of specific countermeasures to specific complaints. To avoid argument over details, we need to start with a high level agreement on the outputs an ideal system would provide so that we can compare it to where we are and see the gaps. And this is true when we are dealing with any systemic problem. There needs to first be an expectation that we are working towards achieving so that we can pair where we are to where we desire to be. Then we can begin the process of considering the system and how it needs to change in order to reach that ideal goal. Piecemeal solutions very rarely fix systemic problems, but neither are all all at once transformations likely to succeed. Time, attention, resources, and support for improvements are all in limited supply. And, it, and because of this, it's best to concentrate resources, attention, and efforts on building one or small but shining examples of success. The model embodies many of the ideal state notions as possible. These model areas become laboratories for rapid experimentation and, and learning. This allows us to correct failed ideas without too much expense and to copy successes rapidly. It also allows for things to be adjusted more easily if they're not working as planned. Once you have a working model, this can then be scaled up and applied to larger areas. You keep doing this until you have converted the entire system into the new model. The people closest to the work often know best how to improve it. Those who have never done a job are less likely to be aware of the processes in place that direct the workflow. Even the managers who correct, uh, create these workflows don't really have a true understanding of the way that they impact the work that's being done. We need people to own the solutions rather than feel owned by them. There is no room for, bl for blame when we're correcting systemic problems. All the people affected by the systemic problem need to come together to problem solve on how to make the system work better. Pushing big top-down change is inherently slow. With changes at the top, policies can be reversed. Pulling small local change is more likely to survive the leadership changes. People are more likely to maintain and protect what they had a hand in building. So try out simple low-cost solutions immediately, even if they are only partial improvements. When demanding drastic changes to address systemic problems, we sometimes fall into the trap of waiting for the 100% solution. Such a thing rarely exists, and when it does, it comes later in the game with a big price tag. If we can make 60% improvement and make it stick, we can build on that. Remember that any improvement is better than things remaining in the broken and dysfunctional state that they're currently standing in. And because these are human-run systems, it is unlikely that we will ever achieve anything close to perfection. Accepting better goes a long way to reaching those long-term goals towards systemic change. And I think that's about all I have to ramble today about systemic change. I just think that it's important 
that we are aware of how this systemic problem solving and systemic um, solutions really work. So thanks for coming and spending time with me. If you like what you're listening to, please consider supporting my podcast. It really does help. And until we talk again, you guys take care of yourselves. So bye.